Hello everyone, this is uh, Philosophy for the People. After slight technical difficulties, uh, we're here and we're live. And it's been a long time, but we're back. Um, exciting things have happened in my life since we last spoke, Ben. Um, oh. I know, after, after long searching, I have an epic skeleton t-shirt. Nice. Uh, I wanted an epic, epic skeleton t-shirt, which had a skeleton with a gun on it. But the only ones with skeletons with guns on them also had women with guns on them, and they also had boobs. Um, I didn't want that on my T-shirt. Um, so I had to settle for a skeleton with a sword. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with that. Who among us can't relate to that story? <laughs> All bought from the, the places which in America now just actually sell weed, but in the <laughs> UK just, just sell weed paraphernalia and epic T-shirts <laughs> and dream catchers. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we're going to talk about Marxism then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, Karl Marx lived and died uh, many decades before the uh, the the first uh, epic skeleton t-shirt was printed. We should dig him up and then base an epic skeleton t-shirt <laughs> off the skeleton. Fair enough. I, I love to close your be like, oh, I'm done with these essays, and then close them all as I'm finished reading them, and then instantly have to reopen them so I can post a link in chat. Right. <laughs> but what are we talking about this week, this week Ben? <laughs> yeah, so this week uh, we're talking about a book from 1992 called Reconstructing Marxism by uh, Andrew Levine and Eric Olin Wright, and Elliot Sober, uh, which was interesting to me when, when I heard that this book existed, right? So uh, I'd been, uh, you know, a while ago, I think I was teaching a class on uh, G.A. Cohen's book, uh, Karl Marx's Theory of History, and uh, friend Kale used to do all the YouTube stuff for Jacobin, uh, recommended this book to me, or asked if I'd ever heard of it maybe, and uh, and I had not right, and then I think I actually picked up a copy then, but I didn't start reading it until Tibor mentioned it in one of uh, my discussions with him last year. And it's a really interesting book. Uh, and one of the things that you know, like this is not the main point of interest, but one thing that's interesting about it to me is that Elliot Sober is one of the names on the cover. Since uh, Eric Olin Wright is somebody who, you know, I I mean, I'm, I'm sure I first heard his name in like a Jacobin article or something uh, talking about him. Uh, and Andrew Levine, I actually was not familiar with until I read this book, uh, although uh, he I, I did, you know, I've done a little bit of poking into his his other stuff since then. And apparently uh in addition to the academic work, he actually had like a whole, um, like if you go over to Counterpunch, like it looks like he, he wrote mm -hmm. like dozens of articles for them too. So, you know, he was also doing that kind of thing, yeah, you know, uh, yes. Uh, something like that. Yeah. He, uh, he was past, you know, um, I don't know if, you know, yeah, essentially. Right. So, uh, he, so yeah, he's, uh, he's passed away since, but you know, he, he was, you know, he was, seems to be have been pretty uh, prolific in the kind of day-to-day -day political writing as well as the academic stuff. But Elliot Sober is somebody I definitely had heard of. And uh, I had no idea that this man had ever, you know, even been interested in Marxism. Right, uh, I mean, if you go to his Wikipedia and you type in Marx, the only result is in the bibliography. Yeah, for that this book, right? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, every, everything else is about uh, philosophy or biology. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so mostly, you know, the reason that I certainly heard lots about Elliot Sober, you know, during the the late Jurassic when I was in graduate school was uh, that, you know, he was he was a very big deal as a philosophy of science guy, as you say, philosophy of biology. Um, he was somebody who sort of, you know, this is the time when uh, in the, you know, ridiculous country where I live, you know, we were kind of having the last of the school board wars against, you know, about like teaching intelligent design and all of that stuff. Uh, and, you know, and, and he was definitely, you know, he was like a fairly prominent good guy 
in that conflict and uh you know as uh an advocate of you know darwinian uh, evolution and uh, the separation of church and state and all that good stuff and um and yeah your, just, your sound has just gone bad i don't know if you've unplugged your mic Ooh, uh i did not let me and you're now you're normal again exciting i just okay. have to scare it okay <laughs> all right fair enough yeah it's, it's the uh the the uh device whose name I'm not remembering right now that you plug the mic into. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing <laughs> Yeah, the thing in my Bob, you know, it's it's blinking as I talk and the way it's supposed mm-hmm. to. Uh, but in any case, uh, that so so it, you know, he I don't know, I think he also wrote like a textbook, you know, uh that that I remember for that period. So he was a big deal, but not for this, right? Like mm-hmm. and it's 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 just interesting that um you know even if watered down in certain respects we'll get into right you know that like there is like a lot of core marxist and socialist stuff that's advocated in this book it's like wow that's uh, not a side of elliot sober i knew existed uh, but in any case if you know if you're sort of familiar in a general way with um with like Karl Marx's theory of history, that book that I mentioned earlier, which is originally from the late 1970s. Um, the, there was another edition that was like 2001, uh, 2000. Uh, and that kind of style of analytical Marxism, uh, by which I mean, uh, so, you know, analytical Marxism in the most general sense, I mean, the sort of closest to a canonical definition I think exists is the one in uh, the introduction to the 2000 edition of Marx's theory of history, uh, where, you know, Cohen says that, you know, essentially it's about, you know, doing Marxism in a way that uses the methodological tools from uh, mainstream philosophy and social sciences, Um of, you know, sort of ways of trying to think more rigorously that you get from these fields um, that, you know, some Marxists would say are, you know, bad and undialectical or, you know, something like that. Uh, And and in particular, you know, the reason I mentioned Karl Marx's theory of history a couple of times is that, you know, quite a bit of the work in like certainly that Cohen was doing in the the last... um, you know, decade, uh, really decade or two of his life, uh, you know, especially was normative philosophy. He was like arguing with with libertarians and, and Rawlsians about, uh, you know, property and distributive justice and all that stuff, which is, you know, which is good stuff. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, I actually like the vast majority of, of, you know, I've got criticisms, but, you know, I, I like the vast majority of what he says about this, but, you know, there's a sense in which that's not even really Marxism at all, properly speaking. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not, it's not like unmarxist. It's just a different thing, right? That if, if, um, that normal, you know, like when you're, when you're making a normative case for socialism, um, then you're you're doing a different activity than you are when you're on the fact side of the fact value distinction and you're thinking about you know historical materialism or class analysis and i mean like that's the stuff that you know i, I really think of more as like marxism properly right. speaking it's, i mean there's, there's different ideas of what we might mean by marxism but there are some people who will insist that kind of marxism has no normative dimension but in that case unless you think there shouldn't be any normative dimension in our society generally yeah. or whatever, that there shouldn't really be normative politics, which seems impossible. Yeah. And then you have to accept that there is some like good normative, non Marxist in some sense, pro socialist. Yeah. Argument. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like you could either say like I mean, ultimately, it's probably just a semantic disagreement. You could either say that, you know, Marxism does have a normative dimension, which, you know, comes apart from its other dimensions, or uh, or you can say, well, that's not Marxism, but it's, like, also good, right? And either way, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to talk either way, but... Um, but in uh, but the the focus of reconstructing Marxism is overwhelmingly on you know non normative Marxism on historical materialism and class analysis, uh, and there's like I, don't, I mean like I think 
there's you add it all up and there's probably like a page two pages that uh of that that book that uh that deal sort of directly with um you know with normative subjects which you know i i like just because um not because i think that you know normative pro-socialist argumentation is a bad thing in fact i clearly think it's a good thing i do it all the time um uh, but just because i'm a fan of you know analytical marxism as a research program in general and and uh and i i would like more attention to be paid to uh to the to those other you know if you want to talk this way those other dimensions of uh of marxism and and i think that this book is really worth reading even though in the essay that we're you know they're we're kind of talking about a couple of essays today because they're all they're all uh you know connected in the, in the subject matter but the main essay that we're talking about today i'm i'm you know criticizing the stuff in the book that i disagree with but you know before getting into the criticisms i really would say look if you're at all interested in this stuff um you know read the book it's uh it's a very very carefully uh it's very clearly written it's it's like very you know it's very careful and rigorous and it's you know in in you know making distinctions and sort of spelling out possible alternate views and all that stuff and and i think it was, even, it was unfortunately written in the 90s Yes, that that is kind of ultimately my conclusion that it was unfortunately written in the nineties. Hence, the stuff that I disagree with, I think, is just kind of ambient nineties in the drinking water. Um, but uh, but yeah, like I think this this is in some ways right. Like this is, you know, this is still kind of um, you know the cutting edge of um, of in a certain sense, right, of of this kind of uh, research program uh, because by and large it kind of fizzled out after this, not really because of sort of internal intellectual problems, but just kind of because the ambient 90s dish in, uh, in the drinking water, you know, sort of led to their being less interested and in I think ultimately would be, you know, is, is what I tend to think. I mean, I think you could find stuff in the 2020s that – harkens back to that sort of research program in certain ways i think the obvious case would be uh, vivek chamber's book uh the class matrix is is sort of doing a kind of marxist sociology in a very analytical marxist kind of kind of vein um but you know in terms of this sort of big questions about like you know capital m marxism you know what's uh you know about Marxist theory of history about, you know, um, like what exactly we're talking about when we talk about class analysis, you know, how, you know, uh, is there, you know, some sense in which, you know, in, in which class is more fundamental, you know, than other forms of oppression, et cetera, like that, those kinds of issues, um, you know, I, I think in, in some ways, yeah, in some ways we are still kind of in uh, in 1992, just in the sense that there hasn't really been a uh, an updated version of this book to sort of like revisit this stuff. And you know, uh, now, which you know, there definitely should be. But well, if there's if there's young young scholars listening, that's a research project for you. Yes, please, uh, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the first part of the book, they. <laughs> is devoted to historical materialism uh and and roughly the second part is class analysis uh and i think they have interesting and plausible things to say about um you know historical materialism um i'm maybe a little bit more optimistic than they are about certain aspects of like orthodox historical materialism uh although i also realized that that's like me kind of gesturing at like oh i think we could like i think there's like a decent argument to be made here that i i haven't actually made anywhere right like i just i, I just you know i think that you could i think that you could probably uh fill in some of those blanks in plausible ways uh but uh but basically you know where they come down on you know, historical materialism uh, is is actually still like 
I, honestly, it makes it a little bit confusing to me that, you know, Tibor was as enthusiastic about the book as he is. Cause like, I, right. I, I think that, um, I think that it, it uh, I, I think that it still lands in a much more Marxist place. Uh, right. I mean, from the two essays of yours, that I've read about this book um, to do, to the, even, I mean, apart from maybe this one line, yeah. the end, you're like who, who knows anyway? <laughs> yeah. Um, it does seem very, very Marxist, just with a, a, an infection of nineties to it. With that, but doesn't really like there's so, so, so much less Marxist, Marxist stuff coming out at the same time as this book. This oh book seems God, insanely yeah. orthodox in comparison. Totally, yeah. I mean, you you know, you think about like you know hegemony and social strategy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I was exactly just thinking of that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, so so I mean, do you want to do you want to do like a few minutes on the historical materialism part, or or, or skip straight to the class analysis? I was going to ask if you wanted to talk about the triangle first. Because sure, the triangle is yeah. about them all, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that that is definitely a good way to uh, to to bring it all together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, so yeah, there there is this neat illustration uh, if you go look at the uh, the class analysis essay uh that uh so that's analytical marxism in the 1990s the one that the link is in the uh description below uh um, in the chat if you are listening on this is revolution yes uh i could i could stick it in the other chat as well i guess uh while we're uh, thinking about this uh so um so uh so if there we go. Put it in the. I just put it in the GTA chat. So, um, so yeah. Uh, the first illustration after Andy's beautiful thumbnail that you'll see in there is uh, this triangle, uh, this like triad of uh, of classical Marxism, which is uh, basically so the idea is there are three points and then there are kind of lines connecting uh, each one to the other two. Uh, so there's Marxism as class analysis, Marxism as scientific socialism, and Marxism as class emancipation. So, uh, and, you know, part of their point in introducing this is that part of the appeal of classical Marxism is that it's all of these at the same time, and, and, there are these, and they're sort of mutually reinforcing uh, that this, you know, that... Um, the combination of these three, they say, makes for this sort of very powerful and attractive, um, you know, intellectual program. So, um, so at the top of the triangle is Marxism as class emancipation, which is the thing they spend by far the least time on, uh, which is that normative dimension that um, the that uh, you know they. I they say at one point sort of ideal of classlessness, right? You think about, okay, what, you know, what sort of it's, you know, makes you want to be a uh, Marxist in the first place. And I kind of say in the essay, you could, you could in principle imagine somebody who in a certain sense was a Marxist, but not committed to this, uh, you know, like I think it's sort of psychologically unlikely, but you know, you could, you could imagine somebody who uh, thought that, who was a died in the wool Marxist in the other two senses. They thought that uh, historical materialism was totally right. They thought like Marxist class analysis of contemporary society was totally right. They, you know, maybe even they were so orthodox about both of those that they thought that, you know, they thought that socialism was inevitable, but they, they saw it as like an inevitable tragedy, right? That, uh, that they wanted to prolong, you know, like postpone for as, as long as possible. Um, so, I don't know of anybody with that combination of views. Uh, and as I say, I think it's probably psychologically unlikely, but you could in principle have that. I wonder if um, Peter Hitchens ever <laughs> passed through at some point in his life because he was both a Marxist and now he's like an enormously pessimistic conservative. But due yeah. to the fact that kind of like Marxism as a, as a theory kind of died out for a while, I don't, I'm not sure if there was a, a, a good crossover point from that. Yeah. Uh, he does seem like somebody who could pull it off psychologically, uh, if uh, if anybody could. Um, so yeah, that is a, that is a very interesting question. Like when uh, when Hitchens, you know, if you read his book uh, "Rage Against God," uh, which um, which I I enjoyed. It's like uh, 
There are zero thoughts that I agree with anywhere <laughs> in that book. Um, Backing zero. But I enjoyed the book. Uh, actually, no, he does have one, you know, well, he has a lot of good lines, but there's like a, uh, I mean, he's a good writer, but uh, he has, uh, but there, there is a good line, I think, is in that book that, uh, that, that I guess does express a thought that seems reasonable to me, which is where he says that the, uh, uh, he basically says, I don't know what Christopher is talking about. We weren't raised in Christianity. The religion we were raised in was, and every word starts with a capital letter, we won the war. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, um, you know, it's a, uh, but it's a very strange book, but it's like kind of fascinating because it's really well written and it's a, it's a window into this uh, very alien worldview. Uh, and, you know, cause he's somebody who like, you know, he, he thinks uh, he's like vociferously opposed to legalized marijuana because, you know, he thinks it's so dangerous. He, uh, he, he sort of, uh, as far as I can follow the train of thought in his, uh, like the stuff that he says about religion, a lot of the times, it almost seems like the idea is that the reason you should take a leap of faith and, uh, and believe in God is because like, we need it for social stability. Uh, like, you know, he, he says a lot of things along those lines. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, there might've been a point, you know, I think in the 1970s when he had his, uh, sort of borderline religious experience he uh said he was uh he and his girlfriend were like i don't know backpacking or motorcycling or something through you know continental europe and they uh went into uh and they i don't know i think i don't remember whether it was an actual like painting at a church or it was an art museum or what you know but there was some they saw some painting like renaissance era painting called like the final judgment that was just this like incredibly uh like vivid depiction of uh the the trumpet is just blasted you know for uh for the last last judgment and everybody's like running around terrified and like there's one guy he says is like actually throwing up you know out of out of fear uh in the painting and, and he had this moment of realization that you know he would be one of those people that you know he uh that you know that he was a sinner essentially uh and he says that's the closest thing he's had to a religious experience so uh you know, I'm pretty sure with that trip started, he was a Trotskyist. So, uh, you know, it's it's possible that, you know, there was some point, if only for a week or two, that he had this combination of views. But uh, in any case, uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably very unlikely. So the idea, so for class emancipation, the idea is just that you, you know, that you think that it's, you know, you think it's a problem for both people's, you know, freedom to kind of live their lives the way they want to and to sort of have also collective democratic input over you know what happens to resources uh for society to be divided to social classes in the way that it is under uh, under capitalism uh and, and this is actually going to be important even though it's the part they spend the less the least time on um i i think that i think that where they talk about this is where the the problem comes in from my perspective, right? Because uh, even though this part isn't wrong necessarily, I think it's something to like kind of keep a close eye on where they say, uh, so this is like one particular ideal of, you know, emancipatory ideal. And you could have, uh, you could have others, you know, they, they mentioned uh, feminism, for example, that, you know, there's like an ideal of gender equality, um and you know but this is the this is sort of the one that that you know happens to be associated with the the marxist program and, the, and there's kind of a paragraph there where they say oh well um uh, some marxists have, have sort of seen marxism you know that seen class emancipation or whatever is like the sort of general uh you know like this sort of general vision of human emancipation not just like one aspect of it uh, but, um, but we don't really buy into the idea that, uh, that, you know, class emancipation is, is sort of more important or fundamental, uh, than, than other kinds. And, Which and I think that, by mostly like imposing like a ridiculously high standard for what would count as class. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So this is the this is the thing that I'm really digging them on, right? Because after the historical materialism section, which 
again, takes up quite a bit of the book. I think it's good stuff. Um, you know, I, I do think that it, 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 like, I think it's like a very sort of ruthlessly calling balls and strikes, but like still quite a bit of the traditional picture survives. Um, then they go into this class analysis section and there's this chapter that they kind of refer to in that paragraph that it just said, like, oh, well, we don't think there's, you know, you know, we don't really buy this idea that it's, you know, it's more fundamental, but then you go into the chapter and and it's kind of a strange chapter. It's like, if you're kind of taking it on its own terms, everything that's going on in the chapter, I think is kind of okay. But like the way that they're connected it to that sort of broader political issue at the mm -hmm. end, I, I find pretty unconvincing. So they'll, they, they basically say, okay, well, look, if you think that class analysis is more fundamental to what's going on in society as a whole than other kinds of factors, like uh, the sort of, um, you know, uh, autonomous, you know, political, like state level things that, you know, that like a neo Weberian like Tibor might, you know, might, might make a big deal of, or uh, gender uh, structures, for example, uh, then, you know, in order to even evaluate that, we need to take a step back and say, what does it mean to say that, like, one factor is more important or more fundamental than other factors and lead into some outcome? Uh, that's the sort of more general, and you know, here you can kind of see them going into, like, somebody like Elliot Sober's uh, bailiwick because, because he's, you know, it's like, this is a very like philosophy of science -y kind of, kind of question. Like, you know, like, like, what do we, you know, what do we even mean when we say that, uh, that like one thing is a bigger or more important or more fundamental cause of an outcome than something else. And they make some reasonable distinctions here. Um, but I think in some ways we're, in some ways where I think they go off track is kind of right at the beginning. Cause they, they say, okay, there's an obvious sense in which one thing can be big, more important or more fundamental, like in a pragmatic sense that it's like, just given whatever questions happen to interest the investigators, right. That they're, they're like one thing could be more fundamental than another for answering that question. But you know, what we're really trying to figure out is like, you know, whether something could be like objectively more fundamental than, uh, than something else. And what could that even mean? And so they basically make a couple of cuts. The first one is, um, so if we're talking about explanatory primacy, one thing is a more primary explanation than another. First cut is um, quantitative versus qualitative, right? So, uh, so in other words, um, that does are there two factors that both contribute in the same way, but just one of them does more than the other, right? That would be quantitative or qualitative as they're you know contributed in different ways. And then within quantitative, they say, okay, we could essentially we could talk about either um, um, it's like essentially, I think this might not be their exact wording, but it's essentially like potency or frequency. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they give the example of like, um, you know, private, you know, like privacy and causing cancer between plutonium and cigarettes that right. uh, there's a clear sense in which plutonium is a sort of more uh, powerful cause of cancer than, than, than cigarettes uh, that the, you know, that the amount you take the amount of tobacco in one, one, one cigarette, that's, that's not going to have much cancer causing power. But if you take the equivalent amount of plutonium, uh, that's going to have much more, but uh, there's also a sense in which uh, the what is it? it's like the distribution dependent or something. There's a sense in which cigarettes are a more important cause of cancer than plutonium. <laughs> uh, the completely normal sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your husband think. Yeah, yeah. Which, which seems to be the problem, right? Because then it seems like, well, it does seem like that class is just like cigarettes, even if yeah. if, if sexism is is like plutonium or whatever, in the fact that obviously there's very particular instances, at the very least, where sexism has more ex explanation than, than class power for explaining 
very particular events once you zoom into the trees. But if we're speaking generally about things like what causes the most cancer in our society, then we should say cigarettes. And if you think about like what kind of social problem is primary, then it seems like we can say class. Yeah. Uh, so this is the sort of move that's that's pretty close to to what I end up uh, end up saying, you know. But uh, but I think the important thing to track here, yeah. So cigarettes are a more important cause of cancer in the sense that cigarettes cause a whole lot more cancer uh, than plutonium does. In the normal sense of the term. Uh, so, but either way, right. They think these are sort of both legitimate ways of using, uh, of using like privacy language when it's quantitative and, uh, and, but then they're much more skeptical about claims of qualitative privacy, right? So they, they do agree that there are qualitative asymmetries in the ways that different factors produce outcomes that in other words, that there are cases where different causes enter into the chain of cause and effect in like qualitatively different ways. And that this is the case sometimes for class and these other things. So, uh, a, that, um, in fact, like one of the things that class, uh, that like class structures often do, and, you know, and one of the things they say, like Marxists will often point out is, uh, that it, it's, it's it sets the parameters of of what might happen, right? That it doesn't necessarily tell you this is the exact thing that will that will happen, uh, but that it 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 that it sort of limits the range of things that might happen, um, and and they they accept that, right? They say, yeah, that that is that is often true, right? That uh, but. But they're they're skeptical about the idea that this is sort of intrinsically like a, a more fundamental kind of causation than selection within the parameters, right? So they they have this example like you know if there's a you know if there's a bowl of fruit and uh, you know it has you know it it uh, it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have peaches in it, but I like apples better than peaches anyway, right? Is the uh, is the parameter setting uh, contribution, you know, part like the absence of peaches for the bowl, or is my preference for apples uh, more, you know, like a more primary explanation of uh, of of my ultimately having an apple? And they say, sort of say, well, these are just different, right? You know, one's not, you know, one's not more, uh, you know, more primary than the other. And I think this is a little bit of extrapolation from what they say, but I think it's probably fair to say that their view is that um, uh, is that it's that I think they're sort of a little skeptical about the whole like, the very notion of one thing being primary. qualitatively more primary primary than another uh, because you know. I mean, one way of kind of getting at that intuition would just be to say, look, if, uh, you know, if you're going to say there's more, like one thing's making a bigger contribution than another, you're making a more claim. And for there to be more, there has to be a, a you know, they have to be commensurable, right? There has to be like a single scale we could use to uh, to measure both of them. And so if you're saying, well, they're just c contributing in qualitatively different ways, then there's no sense in which one is more than another, which I kind of went back and forth while I was reading about how persuasive I found that part of the argument. Uh, I, I do see their point, but I also wonder if there are, uh, I mean, basically my two quibbles about this are one, I think that... I think that there are there's a lot of places when I was reading this whole discussion where I kept thinking like why don't we just disambiguate why don't we just say like you know more important you know like privacy subset you know subscript one privacy subscript two right you know that it's like why 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 not just say they're like yeah there's a certain sense in which something's more primary because of this but you know it's it's not because of that uh, and and I you know that. Like, because some of the things they were dismissing, I I actually do think that there's it does seem totally crazy to say that that would mm -hmm. be a form of greater privacy. So I wondered if they're setting the the bar just like artificially too high. 
Uh, and then, you know, I also thought there are just possibilities that there's kind of leave it on the table, right? Like, like, okay, if, if there are different, you know, levels of analysis, different ways that something could contribute, like, could it be possible that like, there could be a sense in which, you know, the levels themselves are sort of naturally ordered so that, you know, one is a more fundamental kind of contribution than another. I'm not sure, but like, I, I, I wish they'd at least sort of taken the time to to kind of explain why not, right? If not, but none of this really gets at my main objection to this because I'm sort of happy. Like I don't like just as a sort of qua like philosophy of science, right? Just just sort of like reading this on that level of abstraction. Are they totally right about this? I don't know. Maybe right. Like it's 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 not it's not horribly implausible or anything. But, um, but I also think that then at the end, when they introduce that, you know, Marxist triad and, um, and say, and, you know, and, and they say the thing about class emancipation versus other kinds of emancipation, that there's a, there's a, there's a leap right from, from there to there, right? Cause they reference this chapter to justify that, but I don't think the chapter does justify it because mm -hmm. basically my move would be to say, and like I, I get their point, you know, is that like, you know, when we're just sort of thinking about what's objectively more explanatorily primary, um, you know, is there for any particular aspect of the society that we live in, is there any guarantee that you know class or economic factors is going to have a greater quantitative contribution in that cigarettes versus plutonium kind of way than than gender or anything else? Maybe not, right? Like that might be a little much to sort of, you know, be a priori sure of. But, um, but I, I sort of don't think it really matters, right? Like, because because I because I think that the thing that that bothered me about all of this, where the '90s ishness comes in, is that there. It seems to me that um, that there's a pretty powerful political tug, not conscious, I'm sure, but still there, right? That, uh, that existed. If you're like a lefty academic of that era to be pretty resistant to the idea that there's a like strong sense in which class is primary over these other things. We've just invented this word called, it, called intersectionality and we're going to abide by it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I think so. Uh, so I think it kind of has to be read in that context. And it's like, well, hold on, man. I could accept every single conceptual move you make in this whole chapter and still say, yeah, okay. But what if, as an investigator, the questions that pragmatically interest me are how to arrive at a society with as little oppression as possible? Um, then it seems to me that there are extremely good reasons that we, we aren't really considering here to think that pragmatically, relative to that question, class is actually primary. Uh, that if you're, because, you know, I mean, especially like, you know, I mean, look, if you're, you know, if you're having this discussion in Saudi Arabia, uh, then, um, you know, then, you know, I, I think that the sort of... Uh, even with, you know, even while capitalism persists, right, you know, that there's like quite a bit you could do to equalize gender relations that has not been done yet, right? But um, if you're having this discussion in an advanced liberal capitalist country in the 21st century or even 1992, right, then it seems to me that, you know, when it comes to you know, civil rights, uh, legal equality, all that stuff. Even in 1992, you've pretty much won the war. Like what's left is like kind of mopping up, you know, some like pockets of insurgency here and there, but like, you know, you've pretty much won the war. Um, and that's not to say that there isn't, a, that there aren't kinds of gender inequality that don't most definitely persist, but then we think about the kinds that do persist, just to stick with that example for a moment, you know, we could do race in a second. Like it's what's the most powerful lever that we have to, to do anything about it. Right. And, uh, and, and it seems to me 
that the most powerful levers are are economic. Uh, that um, you know, if you just think about how many people, for example, don't leave bad or even physically abusive relationships because they can't afford to strike out on their own, they're worried about what their lives are going to be like. Um, then this would be, you know, this would be a, a pretty, pretty obvious, uh, you know, pretty obvious case, right? Or, you know, you think about the ways that, um, you know, kind of different kinds of child rearing relationships, you know, different couples, you know, might ideally like to have if they had lots of money, right? That's uh, versus, you know, versus what they, they do have, right? You know, I, I think that having a more economically egalitarian society is like kind of the main thing that would address those. And then especially when you start, you know, you move from gender and you start thinking about, you know, race, which I actually originally, um, you know, for about, I don't know, for like the last 10 months or something I've, I've gone, I've, I, I have, uh, I've been forcing myself to be super strict about this 3000 word upper limit, you know, for these essays. Uh, so originally I had that I had a, to end up cutting this whole thing about ontology of race. I had like four paragraphs on that. Um, but, you know, suffice to say now, uh, I, I think the idea that there is this like thing called race that exists uh, is, is a, is a bit of an issue. It's something that could, 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 you know, could stand to be a little bit more careful about how we talk about, but you know, racial, um, you know, just not to say, of course, that racial prejudice doesn't exist and have bad consequences in the world. Of course it does. And it's also not to say that racial disparities don't exist. Uh, of course they do right. Massively. But when you say, Oh, see, so we need to be thinking in terms of this like independent axis of oppression and what we're going to do about that independent axis of oppression. I tend to think that misses the point for, for two reasons, right? So there's a reason the, the illustration for this one is uh, the three authors of reconstructing Marxism, you know, right. Levine and sober uh, plus Adolf Reed, right. As sort of the, uh, the, the representative of uh, the view that I find more compelling about all of this and the, the sort of, you know, and, and basically the sort of point that you get from uh, from thinkers like him is two things, right? One is normative and the other is is strategic. So the, the normative point is, well, hold on. Like, if black people, if there's this disparity, black people are more likely than white people to live in poverty and thus experience all the social ills that, uh, that come with poverty. Um, you know, substandard education, higher crime rate, militarized policing, mass incarceration, all that stuff, right? Okay. Is the thing that's the problem here, the disparity or the thing itself, right? Like, like, like in other words, if there was some bit of social engineering we could get, we could do that would result in exactly demographically appropriate sections of every population living in poverty and experiencing all those horrors, would we say, oh, good, mission accomplished, uh, we've achieved justice, right? Uh, or is, uh, or would we say, well, actually, <laughs> this is uh, a- at least a little unclear, uh, you know, how much this even counts as progress. Um, so that's the normative thing. But even if you, even if you disregard the normative point, even if you think, no, 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 all that matters is that there are disparities, I would still say on a strategic level, okay, well, What's the plan? Uh, yeah, that, that even if we only take it that that's a problem, it's still not going to be solved by in-job uh, privilege workshops. Yes, right. Yes. It is most definitely not going to be solved by uh, privilege workshops uh, that, uh, that yes, the what are, the, what are those like privilege walks where people, you know, people like take a step forward or backwards for every, you know, every layer of privilege that they uh, that they have uh and um it is weird how much of privilege theory and kind of workshops and so on are about kind of like publicly humiliating workers <laughs> yes there's so much of that in like an uh, organized systemic manner yeah yeah no I mean, it, it, yeah i was gonna say because i gotta talk about my phd for once oh yeah um, yeah after kind of the abolition, because you've been talking about how we basically abolished the kind of the formal legal inequalities that were part of the early liberal age and the previous feudal age, or especially dominant in the previous feudal age. 
which were kind of the legal separations between persons. And now there's like one or two that still exist, which is often the the common thing where um, women are excluded from frontline combat service. But apart yeah. from that, it's more or less universal that kind of human adults uh, have equal rights, have formal legal yeah. equality. And But what we're left with after that is two forms of inequality, one of which is kind of material inequality, which is something which is booming constantly, yeah. um, has been for, for 40 years now. And then there's also the informal inequalities of the social sphere, as Chandler calls them. And what, what privilege theory and what kind of woke stuff focuses on is very much on these informal inequalities of the social sphere, which is yeah. the thing, you know, where like, black people get followed around Walmart. Right. But do we really think that like security guards are like so kind of ontologically racist that that has more to do with kind of bad training rather than, you know, kind of a poor mapping of who and who is not as poor. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that that sounds exactly right to me. I think that there's a lot like, um, that there is a lot of, um, you know, I mean, I think the obvious reality when you're talking about stuff like Walmart security or you're talking about police violence, et cetera, like the obvious reality of it is that, um, is that a lot of times blackness is sort of used as a, as, as a, you know, as a proxy as like, Oh, you know, you're, you know, you're more likely to be poor, which is why every once in a while when, you know, you have the, uh, the, you know, like black professor at Ivy league university or something is like hassled uh, in some, you know, in some situation by the cop, that's a, it's a scandal, right? Cause the, the system misfired. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And, and, you know, and I, and I think even there, right. The, the, the point applies, right. I mean, more, you know, like, like I, I, I think yeah, that, that's exactly, that's almost certainly that security guard making an error, an error for thing yeah. they get fired for. And one yeah, was yeah, they yeah. if they had correctly kind of assigned the demographics of the person. What they're doing is because they're racist and because they live in a racist society, they're accidentally misattributing this black person to be like a poor person or a disruptive person or, or so on. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, and, you know, and, and if, if you want to solve that problem, I think there are good reasons to think that, um, you know, moves even partially right in the direction of a more materially equal society are going to do more to solve it than consciousness raising Walmart security guards. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, look, the, you know, so yeah, clearly all of the, uh, all of the sort of, you know, ritual abasement at work, uh, you know, is, uh, is not something that, uh, cures racism in fact at this point we we actually have a fair amount of empirical data on that um empirical data which seemingly was all published after i started my phd and i'm just reading now at the end (laughs) yeah right so it's well you know good news is that you're still reading it before most people since uh they're they're just not bothering to uh but yeah i mean none of the none of the data you know supports that stuff working uh, it, it sort of doesn't make very much sense at a common sense level to think that it, it would work very well. Um, and it's, so if that, if it's not that, then like, then what is the plan? I mean, a more serious idea could be that you could have, um, you could have material redistribution, not with the aim of just creating a generally equal society, but, uh, but, but like with the aim specifically of, eliminating racial disparities uh in in wealth which is a very polysyllabic way of saying reparations right that's the uh that uh yes just need more anti-racist babies that will surely do it right uh, and, uh, and you know that doesn't um you know i mean I, as i said take you know like in the thought experiment where you could just magically do that right like you know we will away all the political obstacles um then that makes more sense than oh we we just you know we just need to to book robin d'angelo to yell at more people at work uh but uh but also 
it's sort of the ultimate, you know, it's like the, uh, the South park thing with the, the stealing underpants question mark profit, you know, that they, that like, uh, where, what's the scenario where this would actually happen, right? Like yeah. this is, um, well, yeah. I mean, I was going to say that actually discursively, it does actually have the effect of really challenging something, but that is it, the thing it really challenges is the thing we'd want to keep, which is kind of this these liberal rights that we've won. Yeah, this is, no. This is what Lewis Gordon says about this, um, a, a professor in, from Connecticut. He says that, you know, these legal rights, these, these formal things, you know, things that are called privilege, all things that we should all want. And yeah. so dis discursively, it actually flips everything around by it essentially denounces all the good things we do have because some people lack them, which seems completely backwards. And, you know, intentionally privilege is trying to flip the discursive frame around in this way, but it flips it around and it looks really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I actually wrote an essay for Arc Digital Media, I think maybe back in 2020, uh, called The Problem with Privilege Talk, uh, which is something that I think I might have had to cut out of an early draft of Canceling Comedians, but uh, it's... Uh, but, you know, essentially it was it was making this point that, uh, that like, look... I really, you know, I suspect that that part of what it gets down to is a lot of liberals feel uncomfortable using the word oppression because, like, that sounds that has a very, um, I don't know, like retro new left kind of you know kind of sound to it, right? Whereas, like, privilege goes down a little easier. Uh, but uh, but it's 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 actually really bad to redefine things that absolutely everybody should have as a big, a big appeal of it is because from the start privilege is being regarded as something that people are unaware of right so you do this thing both of revealing but saying it's kind of not your fault in another way like kind of it was hidden from you and now it's shown and you can do these things but you know it's not it's not like racism that you've you've obviously see every day white privilege is this hidden hidden thing you know yeah, yeah, that's the uh, the invisible knapsack, right? That was the Peggy yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Kintosh thing, which uh, some of that, if you actually read that list, some of it is absolutely insane, like, just because it's, like... I mean, the, the most fascinating one is she says that one of her privileges as a white person is the ability to easily get an article, an academic article on white privilege published, which is like, no, of, of course it fucking isn't. It's because you're an academic. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's such an an obviously more overdetermining factor than that you're white. Yes, in fact, it'd probably be probably have been easier if uh, if she was an academic and everything else was the same, but she wasn't. Uh, like realistically, yes. uh, but but yeah, the one I always found like bizarre was uh, that it's a white privilege that you can go into a uh, a record store. You can tell it's an old article, right? You know that they are more record stores, uh, but. Uh, uh, go into a record store and, and easily find, you know, music made by people of my race. It's like, is the history of popular music in, in Peggy's <laughs> alternate dimension very different from ours? Because uh, that is not an exclusively white privilege, let me tell you. Uh, but, um, but yeah, like like a, a lot of the list is just like, oh, just kind of being treated with the respect that like any person should be, right? It's like, yeah. no, that's that's not a privilege. Uh, that's not something. It's like, oh, look, I just discovered that I got this without earning it. It's like nobody should have to earn that, right? That's uh, <laughs> that that should be uh, that should be a default for everybody. And like a lot of the stuff I would see over the years, um, I feel like I see a, a bit less now, but it's hard to tell whether that's. It's actually really interesting. In her second article on privilege, she yeah. kind of makes this point and and makes the point that there should actually be a careful distinction between the things we'd wish to universalize and things we would wish to abolish. Like we'd want, for instance, you know, like uh, the ability for male academics to kind of talk down to women academics, not to be universalized to, to women academics, but got rid of, you know, and um, what other things would want to be universalized. But then she drops that and doesn't elaborate on in her, in her future privilege work and then no one takes her up on it. So yeah. then we just do the basic version of privilege. It was, it's weird. <laughs> she actually yeah, says, no, is... I think now privilege is out of date. 
in like the second article on privilege <laughs> on one white. She, so the moment of lucidity passed and she went right back to it. Um, yeah, right. Like, uh, but so yeah, I feel like I see this less now. I don't know how much of that is a larger political cultural vibe shift and how much of that is just that I've managed to surround myself uh, with, uh, with, you know, people I find less annoying, but um uh, but like, I feel like I used to see this a lot in cases where like some, you know, I don't know, like uh, some group of like right wing white people would be in a conversation, would be in a confrontation with the police, but like, aha, white privilege. They didn't just kill them all. It's like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is that what we want? Uh, it's the, uh, like, that's the thing that we want to universalize is, is, is cops just like being really quick to kill people. Uh, in these that, kinds of situations. A, a white a white Republican congresswoman used the phrase like, yes, yes. When Hunter Biden came in to, uh, I think. Yeah. 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 That was, uh, I think that was, I think that was Marjorie Taylor Greene. That's, um, who, who said that, who's the, uh, the, if, if you've only vaguely heard of her, you know, you probably mostly heard of her in connection with the Jewish space lasers. Uh, it, but, it wasn't her. It was like her, some semi never Trumpo South Carolina uh, congresswoman. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe somebody in the chat will know. But um, but yeah, uh, like I, you know, so yeah, I, I think that this is you know, so like at least material reparations, sort of again relative to the flawed normative assumption, at least makes some sense as like a solution to disparities. But even if we're bracketing the normative objection and we're saying, yeah, the, 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 the thing that we care about is disparities. It doesn't really matter uh, where the bottom is uh, or where the top is. It just matters that the, the distribution is right. Even if we're assuming that the obvious problem with saying that that's the lever we should be pulling on is that it's stuck, right? It's uh, the, mm -hmm. this is, you know, like, look, any sort of social change that would be bad for the material interests of uh, the people who have the most power in our society is incredibly difficult at the best of times, right? That, that, that's just sort of a, a general, um, I think that's just a true generalization uh, that about really any society that the people who are, you know, if the people who have the most power in that society would be adversely affected by some change in the distribution of resources, achieving it, is very hard. Not necessarily impossible, but very hard. But that's the baseline for what I want. And it's also the baseline for like reparation style proposals. But I would point out that if you're talking about achieving universal um, economic redistribution, right? You know, so, so you're, you know, like just to pick a sort of incremental social democratic example, you know, you're talking about, for example, fixing the disparity uh, in how many, you know, the percentages of white and black people who don't have health insurance by just uh, having universal health insurance for everybody, um, then relative to the fact that, sure, very, very tall mountain to, to climb politically, but at least it's possible in principle to see how you could get together a majority of the population on board with that proposal, which really seems like a bare minimum necessary condition for overcoming the obstacles to any kind of proposal for uh, redistributive uh, social change. Whereas if you're talking about proposals that sort of by definition uh, only benefit some people uh, and, you know, not most people, uh, then, you know, that seems just much more difficult on its face, right? Like this, this seems like a pretty obvious, uh, this seems like a pretty obvious problem. Uh, and, you know, one that, you know, one that generalizes, right? So I think there's both a sort of normative thing that, you know, you alluded to earlier said, okay, look, uh, it's actually a good thing that we have certain kinds of um, ideals of, uh, of like liberal universalism in place that, you know, that everybody should get the same package of rights, no matter what, like that, that is a, that, you know, that's sort of, I mean, view from 10,000 feet, right? That's the, the bourgeois revolution, which was a good thing. Um, and, you know, and the sort of completion of it through the civil rights movement and, you know, and, and legal equality for women and all of that stuff was a good thing, right? Like that's a, that's a good foundation to, 
to build on. And so I think there's a, I think trying to kind of um, undermine it in a way that would restore differential legal statuses, even with an anti-oppression intention is something you should probably be real careful about in any case. Right. But, uh, but then, uh, but then beyond growth, but for rights. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's degrowth and degrowth and uh, human rights. Uh, that's which, you know, I tend to think would also come from the, you know, the usual kind of degrowth anyway, but, uh, that's, um, but, but even if you're not sort of troubled by the, the normative worry, it's still just uh, strategically, like, I, I think it remains true that the the best, like the, you know, your best shot at getting social change that would adversely affect the interests of the people whose interests are more powerful is by making your pitch in a way that at least can appeal to the majority of the population. And, you know, this itself gives me a reason to think that sort of universalist economic uh, economic solutions to oppression are, you know, the, the thing on which it makes the most sense to focus. Cause you know, cause it's the not, not because it would like magically get rid of all other forms of prejudice or injustice. I actually don't think that, right. Like I, I, you know, I, I think some of that stuff, you know, has like, you know, it's like plutonium. It has a long uh, half-life. Uh, but, uh, but because if you, if you're trying to think, okay, what are the thing my politics could be oriented towards that are going to have the most effects in bringing about a world with the least oppression and injustice. And for that matter, even casual social prejudice in it, um, you know, that, that seems like the ticket to me. Nice. Did you want to talk about historical materialism or you want to kind of taper off? Cause I, I do have an anecdote to tell. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Let's, yeah, let's do your, your anecdote and let's do like 10 minutes on historical materialism. Well, because in the historical materialism essay, you were speaking about um, kind of the collapse of the Roman empire and the, the, you know, the slave mode of production collapsing and the imperial center collapsing and all this European trade network collapsing. But the whole time I was like, why don't we talk about the Bronze Age collapse, the Bronze Age collapse, which I guess, you know, maybe isn't the right thing to talk about because Marx didn't really know about the Bronze Age collapse apart from in probably like very vague terms. Uh, yeah. Tell, I actually, I actually know very little about this. What, uh, All right. Tell, tell me more. Well, well, probably the most genuinely straightforward, massive social decline that we had was the Bronze Age collapse where we went from... The, 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 the Bronze, Bronze Age collapse, you, you said? I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah, yeah. Bronze Age okay. collapse. Okay. Where yeah. we went from having state societies in Egypt, in Mycenae, Greece, in um, Assyria, and these sorts of places. These societies collapsed, and outside of Egypt, state society in Europe disappeared. Um, state society in Europe also broadly disappeared after the collapse of the Roman Empire, uh, but to a much it was much less collapsed, um, and from a high starting point already, as well as in it survived in the Eastern Roman Empire, um, and even in Egypt things got very very bad for very very many people, and it was a combination of disease um, and barbarian invasion, but also because of the like these Bronze Age states had like insane command economies on incredibly low technologies to, to degrees you wouldn't really, you know, you wouldn't really believe the, the degree of like command economy they had uh, by like a bureaucratic state. And this was just incredibly vulnerable to once one part of it goes, once the trade networks start breaking down, like, you know, they, they, they were based on bronze, but no yeah. country had both copper and tin in it. And so okay. the, principle of your society the oh, thing huh. the most basic material you need uh -huh. to do bronze age stuff bronze can only be made through like a large scale uh, international trade network but i say this all because I, I had a very interesting anecdote which is in homer's odyssey and the iliad he talks about the mycenaean greeks and he talks about the, their military forces but he imagines that the mycenaean military was like the military of the Greek Dark Ages where he was writing from. 
which yeah. is to say it was like heroic band of infantry. But that wasn't true. The Mycenaean state had professional chariot cavalry based on kind of like a barracks network with armories and so on. It was not the heroic bands of the Greek Dark Age. And it's just very interesting that Homer's work of the Odyssey and the Iliad are the pro- probably the only genuinely post-apocalyptic fiction we have in the sense <laughs> not of fiction that's written but, about a hypothetical apocalypse. Fic- fiction that was written after the apocalypse, you know, yes. trying to imagine life before it. Nice. Yeah, yeah. As, as if now we imagine that like World War II was a battle between like biker gangs or something like this. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. No, this is this is largely uh new to me. I I have I think uh um you know, I don't know. There's uh probably the uh uh probably fewer podcasts and stuff about it. So uh so that that's why I use Rome. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I mean the you know, the essential point about uh you know, historical materialism which uh you know, both of the other two essays we mentioned were about. So there's the historical materialism in the 1990s, which was the first of the two uh, reconstructed Marxism essays, and then uh, did a midweek bonus essay last week, with, you know, shorter than like a, a real Sunday one, uh, called uh, "What Marxist Materialism Isn't." And both of these are, you know, about historical materialism and the kind of reason that the collapse of the Roman Empire is, you know, coming in or you know, maybe that the Bronze Age collapse should have come in is uh, that um, these are cases where uh, the there's actual regression in in the development of the the forces of production, which um, you know I, th- I think one of the basic premises of historical materialism is that the sort of trend line always is always going to go up, right? You know that mm-hmm. the uh, that uh, you know that there's the sort of Transhistorical tendency for uh, the forces of production to to develop over the long term, and um, and I, I think you I think you do end up needing that to you know to make sense of you know some other claims, but I actually think that's fine, right? And it's like you know clearly it's not like Marx was unaware, you know, maybe about the Bronze Age stuff, but you know certainly of the uh, the the Roman case, right? I mean, like uh, in fact, there's like. In fact, that's pro- presumably what he's primarily thinking of in the Communist Manifesto, where he talks about the uh, class struggle and need with either the victory of a new class, a new mode of production, or or uh, the common the uh, the common collapse of the uh, the contending classes. Right, sort of one right. of the one of the earliest socialism or barbarism uh, arguments uh, made by uh, made in the tradition. So, uh, but that's but you know the point is that. It doesn't, you know, it takes, it's not like, oh, there's just some sort of complicated cultural contingency that goes into whether the trend line tends to go up or tends to go down. It's like, no, uh, it tends to go up and it takes something, it takes some like absolutely catastrophic uh, exogenous shock on the level of the collapse of the Roman Empire, or, you know, the Bronze Age collapse in order for it to go down for like a while right but yeah, like, it, it, normally you know when the roman empire collapses china is just doing fine right or when china has the warring yeah. state period then assyria the new assyrian empire is doing just fine or the indus yeah. valley situa- civilizations are doing just fine so because you have these three centers of state societies there was never i don't think there was ever a point where they all went together yeah yeah Right. Like, uh, and, and even, even, even when one of them did, right. It's like, I mean, look, I would, I would note that the, uh, level of development in uh, 21st century Italy is, is, is greater than, uh, than that of third century Rome. Right. Like, uh, right, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, bronze age Egypt was sick as hell, but I'm sure if the current Egyptian state put their mind to it, they could build some pyramids. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, in fact, I think they could probably, you know, they, they choose not to because uh, they're they're uh, you know they're less concerned with uh, with their their you know heads of state uh, uh, you know future journeys into the land of the dead. But uh, they um, but uh, but yes, if the current Egyptian state decided to build some pyramids, they could do it way faster and more efficiently. Than, do you know who, uh, do you know who couldn't? The British state. 
it'd be half built after 20 years and then it'd be cancelled. Yeah, that's kind of fair. Um, and, you know, yeah, that which is also, um, you know, credit where credit's due. Uh, I saw a good post by um, uh, Saurabh Amari earlier today where he's talking about, he's saying, like, that there is actually, like, some genuine insight in all those complaints about, like, you know, what happened to the flying cars we were promised that, you know, it's like the... Uh, uh, you know, mid-century, you know, he said like New Deal era, you know, technological innovations were awe-inspiring and terrified, you know, uh, nukes going to the moon, uh, you know. Uh, it's interesting to think back on um, like early gender transition that people did and how yeah. they were treated in like um, public media, where yeah. it was this thing of, where people were like, you know, they when they when a doctor said I've I've turned this person from a man to a woman, they were like, "Wow, crazy!" Yeah. But they can they completely believed it. They thought like, "Why would you do that?" But there wasn't the doubt that that's common now, where you know you can't actually do that. And obviously, they were coming from an era where, you know, there was this thing where in the early when they first synthesized uh. insulin. They were uh, walking around the ward where all the dying children were dying from yeah. diabetes and then just injecting them with the synthesized insulin and they were just coming back to life, like on the spot. Like it was right. Christ-like. It was godly what was happening. And there was just yeah. you know, this mid-century both, you know, trust and belief in in doctors, in, in medical science and, and, and science in general, as well as, you know, real results to back it up that I think right now we just can't imagine. Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, I found the tweet. It's there's a deep wisdom behind complaints like what happened to flying cars, what happened to colonizing Mars. Our technological innovations mostly tend towards simulations of mastering the material world rather than actually mastering the material world in grand scales. The technologists, the New Deal, were awesome and terrifying, nukes, literal moonshots, et cetera. The technologies of the neoliberal era are like, whoa, I can point my phone at the song that's playing at the restaurant and instantly download it myself for 99 cents. Uh, which, you know, I think there is, uh, there is some truth to, but, uh, you know, whatever you want to say about like, uh, dysfunction of state building projects, uh, and all that, uh, which is also, you know, some of those, uh, mid-century, well, actually, yeah, I mean, both of his examples of mid-century innovations were, you know, were, were done within the public sector, right? That's, uh, uh, which is, um, you know, which is also, you know, which is also an interesting point that, like, uh, that, you know, I, I think people often miss when they're talking about, you know, economic planning and what can or can't be done with economic planning and all of that stuff. You know, that there are things that economic planning, like, that so far we don't have good, like, models of of centralized uh, state planning doing. Right. I mean, to, to completely but, make up a figure, which might not be maybe right or wrong, I would bet that the Soviet Union, 1945, had a smaller GDP than the NASA budget of 2024. Yes, yes, that but, seems right. <laughs> but the, 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 the Soviets did everything with that, you know, while also doing a hundred other things. Yeah, I mean, there, as I said, there are lots of things that, you know, centralized economic planning hasn't been successful at doing, but one thing that's actually been remarkably successful at doing is uh, technological innovation. Like this is, you know, I mean, the... The Mariana Mazzucato, I think that's her name, right? You know, is that who's like not a socialist or anything like that. But, you know, uh, in her book, The Entrepreneurial State, or, you know, you can watch your TED talk about this. This is like the only time I'll recommend a TED talk. Uh, the, uh, she, ben, like, does, a TED talk. <laughs> she does this thing where she like pulls out, pulls out like an iPhone and points out that like everything that everything in it that like makes it a smartphone, not a dumb phone. Um, is as a result of like state funded research, right? That the, that um, the, the internet itself, uh, the GPS, the, uh, the, uh, the touchscreen technology, you know, I mean, a lot of these things were, were done. Um, you know, a lot of these things were done by the defense department, but I don't, I don't think there's any sort of historical law that, you know, you have to have the ultimate intention of killing people in order to, uh, in order to come up with, uh, come up with these things. I, I was listening to a Soviet astronaut song and the lyrics was like so insanely optimistic, but also I guess backed by the circumstances they were in. 
that it's hard to believe it's not like a sci-fi song. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not written in the 20th or 21st century, but meant to be set in the 23rd century, but was something written in the mid 20th century, meant to be written then. The one thing that gives it away is that in the first verse, he talks about having a final smoke before they launch. <laughs> I the, lyrics, the lyrics, the next verse is, I believe, friends, carav- caravans of rockets will head us forward from star to star on the dusty paths of the distant planets. Our footsteps will be left as our marks. Wow. Uh, like a level of optimism, which is just, we're completely incredulous now of. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Now the uh, the cigarettes are funny. I actually just watched a video essay called uh, "Smoke in the Future," that was basically about like all of the uh, the science fiction. Where like you know, like you watch like the first Alien movie and like everybody's smoking on the spaceship, uh, which is uh, at least the Soviet song has that note of realism. You know that you're having your last one before you get on the spaceship. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, um, so so I think that like, you know, I agree with all that, right? But it's like also as sort of as annoying as like the sort of the thing that was lost from like, you know, the World War II, early Cold War period where there was uh, all of this like grandiose techno optimism uh, on, you know, on, on both sides, right? That uh, That had of the Cold War. Uh, that you know was was still even in the capitalist West was still linked to like the sort of aggressive state sector that was uh, yeah. that, you know was involved in pulling it off right the uh, so it's like I do think that there's something that is depressing about what's been lost there but yeah the the point about historical materialism is just like the actual you know productive capacity of you know of society our ability to uh, to uh, our ability to figure out how to uh, to you know more efficiently you know um, interface with you know with what we get from nature to you know to create things that meet human needs uh, you know does you know that there is this there is this certain tendency for it to you know to go up over yeah, time. We have, we have so much now, which is why so much can be wasted on complete bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's exactly because of that fact, right? We can only have all this insanely silly, silly stuff of, of people having baffling amounts of money, which they use on baffling things, exactly because we live in, by far and away, the most incredibly wealthy history of uh, era of human history ever. Yeah. No, I think that's I think that's what very well said, and you know that's the thing that um, you know. And I know we haven't talked much about the other essay. We'll probably have to save that, but they have a, but like, I think that, um, but yeah, I mean, just to connect a, a dot or two here at the end, I mean, that's the exact fact that, um, you know, that, that makes it so incredibly galling, you know, that we, uh, that we, we do live in such, you know, such an unequal society, right. That, um, that there's absolutely no reason why, you know, I mean, if you, you know, we, in 2024, you know, you take the, the most like awe-inspiringly, um, you know, well-developed productive machine that's ever existed. Uh, and, you know, it could, it could absolutely, you know, so, uh, you know, support like everybody having a good life and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what sort of, uh, annoying work still has to be done, you know, being spread around much more thinly and, you know, and, and, and et cetera. And, you know, I, I think the, like the, the obstacles to this, you know, are, um, you know, t- are, uh, are political, right. They're not, you know, they're not logistical anymore. So, um, you know, and I, I tend to, uh, <laughs> you know, I tend to think that the, you know, there's another thing that they talk about in reconstructing Marxism very briefly, right? But they they sort of have this analogy about like uh, clinical medicine, where they say that um, that the way you know when they think about class analysis, that um, there's supposed to be this kind of feedback loop between Marxist theory and Marxist practice uh, that um, that you you know, the same way that like sort of what happened at a clinical setting would inform, you know, would inform theory and all of that stuff. Uh, and 
they kind of say, well, for better or worse, this is this is broken down, you know, to a great extent because the the sort of traditional Marxist parties that existed in various places around the world in 1992 were, you know, in various places to various varied extents, you know, were were rapidly shedding that, uh, and and you know, and but they sort of tried to look on the bright side and say, well, okay, at least this opens up, you know, much more room for, um, you know, for like. Uh, you know, theoretical innovation because you're not like constrained by the dogmatism of you know the the like Communist Party line or whatever, right? You know, like many you know 20th century Marxist intellectuals were. And you know, fair enough, that is a bright side. But I do think that um, you know, I I do think that all of the kind of identity politics stuff that you know you could see in a relatively small way if we're grading on a curve for the era, uh, creeping into this, uh really shows that it's like, look, if you're just writing from within left liberal academia, it's not like you don't have a feedback loop politically. It's just a different one. Right. And, uh, and you know, it, it, you know, maybe it imposes a less rigid dogma, but the sort of general direction of it is, is actually, I think ultimately, you know, much less helpful because, you know, what if the last uh, 32 years since this book came out of, um, of left liberal identitarianism got us as far as far as achieving a more equal society, I would argue very little. <laughs> I just remember Joe Biden. I was just laughing about Joe Biden. <laughs> um, come on. Pretty- <laughs> got, got, got to spell that out. <laughs> no, I just remember Joe Biden. It's really funny. Because, I what, mean, it's, like he exists? Yeah, I mean, that's the end of, of, of 30 years of liberal identitarianism. It's Joe Biden is president in the year 2024. And yeah. it's meant to be the most important thing in the world that he remains president until 2029. Uh, I mean, I don't know how realistic that is. But, uh, I mean, even if he wins the election, but um, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen some of these recent press conferences. Uh, the man is in bad shape. But, uh, but we could get uh, Kamala uh, you know, if, if he, if he could, if he can limp through the election, uh, we could get, uh, Kamala Harris as president, in which case the uh, press conferences would get, uh, you know, much less sad, but also much funnier. Yeah. She's on, she's on a much more fun collection of drugs than, than Joe Biden is. <laughs> exactly. He's but on yeah. like amphetamines and, and things to make his heart not stop while she's on like four different kinds of Zans. That seems right. And yeah, and it's it's that that yeah, but there you go. That's what the last 32 years of left liberal identity politics have have given us is uh is these people. And uh yeah, I don't know. I'd rather not. You going to watch the Super Bowl? Uh no, I don't think I am because I would have, but uh the Detroit Lions broke my heart by uh, by not making it. Uh, and, and I, I so, hope I hope Taylor Swift loses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I saw somebody. Uh, I I think this was ironic. I don't I don't I don't think this was made by somebody who actually. Uh, who actually thinks this uh, originally? I mean, I saw like the leftist posted it, but it was a. Uh, but it was like a, this this meme that was like uh, yes, very good as it should be. Uh, this meme that was uh, that was like um, you know San Francisco. It was like Team Jesus, and then you know it was the Kansas City Chiefs. You know Ch- Team Soros, and uh, had like a picture of Taylor Swift, and you know the, you know that's. <laughs> Uh, which which would be particularly good if you know if, if San Francisco of all places you know got to be Team Jesus and uh, you know Kansas City was Team Soros. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how um, things keep flipping around. Is I mean, there's this thing of, of American conservatives are you know they're opposing apple pie. Which is, it's liberal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, what are you writing next week, and what do you think we're going to be streaming about next week, Ben? Subject right. to change, but it's good to tease them anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. Uh, so I want you know what? I think regardless of what I write next week, I think we should I think we should cover the essay that came out today because we didn't do it today. 
Uh, so, uh, so that's the one on uh, Jeremy Kaufman, uh, who is a um, libertarian uh, entrepreneur and uh, and politician, uh, and and a you know some bizarre views that he expressed about uh, about property rights and sexual autonomy, and uh, and this is and that's you know that's what I was talking about in uh, in that one. And that seems like it would be a fun stream. So, so we on, should do on, on self ownership, right? Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah, which which does seem to be like a very bizarre and particular thing, which could only emerge out of a certain kind of like analytic political philosophy. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, mean, I mean, if you if you, you can only own your body if you aren't a body, right? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Yes, what's well, self ownership? You're owning yourself, but yeah, that's a. Uh, it's an like, interesting. There has to be some alienation between the things. Yeah, uh, I, I think that, I think people who talk this way are very confused. That's what I argue in the essay. Uh, but um, that the idea that your rights over yourself are a kind of property sort of um, makes very little sense when you actually start to uh, to dig into it. And it's, I, I don't know. I mean, I always think about that line in the manifesto about, you know, all relationships between, you know, humans being reduced to, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, cash nexus, that this is sort of an extreme nerdy philosophical uh, instance of uh, of that being done. But you know, it's like, it's oh. interesting. There was actually a thread about this on Al Sash as Fossey recently, where someone was being like, you know, well, if you self have self ownership, then you have a, a complete right to dispose of yourself as you wish. People were like, well, that's normally not true with normal property, right? So, uh, like, like in the you, sense that you can't burn down your own house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, uh, it's an interesting question, actually. So, you could have, like, yeah, what could you, like, what, what, what would self, what self, 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 self ownership seems like bullshit, but wouldn't even establish that much in the end because there's plenty yep. of stuff which is owned by us, but we can't do loads of different things with. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Like, what rights actually go into property rights and what don't? I mean, like, can, as far as burning down your house, it's like maybe if you live in the middle of nowhere and it's like a very carefully controlled fire. <laughs> maybe. Well, otherwise, if you live in a terrace, then it's not happening. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you flip it back to abortion, you know, and obviously pro life people think yeah. babies or people or whatever. I can't kill someone just because he's in my house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting point. Um, yeah, I, I think I think what exactly this does or doesn't prove like follow from it. Um, you know, it's also an interesting question. Like, I don't know if we lived in a libertarian utopia. If the uh, somebody was in your house without your permission, could you, could you just kill them? Uh, that's I hope not. But uh, I guess you'd have to ask a libertarian about that. <laughs> that's yeah. I, I think. Um, you know, I think if the, yeah, if who's the, if they were dug in so well that like there was, there was, there was no way to get them out of your house except for killing them, uh, then, uh, then yeah, would that be okay? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think this is like, I, I actually like this, this, you know, it's a different one that I give in the essay, but like, I think this is maybe another reason to think this is just a really bad model for, yeah. for sort of trying to make sense of what kind of autonomy we, we think that people have. But yeah, uh, I think it'll be an interesting discussion also because I'm very against the idea of kind of consent-based morality anyway. Yeah, well, uh, hope there's a little bit of consent-based morality in there or else, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you know, that would lead to bad things. But, uh, but yeah, um, I think that, you know, <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, the consent is very important for lots of contexts. It's certainly not the whole of morality, and this is right. And, but the kind of I think I've, I mentioned to you before, but there are quite a lot of young people online who, who have some kind of like morality. yeah, like consent solipsism, where not only yeah. do they think that consent is the, the totality of morality, you'll talk to them about it, and they can't imagine anything else could possibly be kind of the basis of morality, and they'll just yeah. redefine everything else into to be being based on consent. Yeah. Yeah, of a uh, yeah, sort of uh, right overdosed on a certain kind of philosophical liberalism. But um, well, I'm going to play the outro. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Bye, everyone.